So good evening, everyone, and we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for London's climate change conversation about the Draft Climate Emergency Action Plan, or SEEP for short. My name is Deepika, and I am the Environmental Project Specialist at the London Environmental Network. And tonight is going to be a pretty interactive session with lots of discussion about the SEEP, so be sure to get your ideas ready. So first, we would like to start with a land acknowledgement. We'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered for this event on the traditional grounds of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Anapayoak peoples. We would like to recognize the three First Nations communities downriver Dushkanzibi, Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Munsee Delaware Nation. We strive to work with these communities to continue to listen, learn, and restore the natural area back to its original beauty, support environmental initiatives, and help our communities become climate resilient. We recognize the inequities connected to colonization and commit to working towards creating a community that is resilient, vibrant, and just. As tonight's event is about the London's Climate Emergency Action Plan, we do want to ensure that decisions and targets from the plan were also looked at from an Indigenous perspective and has taken Indigenous knowledge into account. So here's the agenda for the evening. So we're going to start off with a brief presentation by city staff on the SEEP. Um, then we're going to go into our first breakout room where you will be asked a couple of questions to discuss. And then we'll come back to the main room and have some polls. Um, after that, we're going to hear some comments from our other partner organizations. So we have Brandon Doxtater from Oneida Nation of the Thames, Skylar Frank from Urban League of London, Leah Derricks from London Environmental Network, and Luis Patricio from Pillar Nonprofit Network. After that, we will go into our second breakout room for more discussion, um, followed by some more polls. And finally, we will have a Q&A period with all partners at the end. So be sure to have your questions ready for that. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll hand it over to Jay from the city to start his presentation. Winter, right in February, that is not a normal time for the Thames to be overflowing its banks. And you just get a sense of the difficulty that people have when you see cars underwater. And you carry on and you start looking in 2019. Here's the Queen's Ave in August. So just a sign of climate change and severe weather trees coming down in a windstorm in August 2020, further damage occurring. So the devastation is right here in London. You don't have to go that far. And in fact, you start looking at how other parts of the landscape are changing. Lyme disease, London has now entered into the high risk area. Two to three years ago, we were not the yellow area on the map. Pests and invasive species, appear to be growing in numbers, not diminishing. So it is amongst us right here in London. So the message is getting clearer, actions required. And when we look at greenhouse gas generation, we look at the data that exists, we've been collecting this for years now here in London. What you see on the right side of the screen are the emissions from how we travel and move in London, the number one sector. But when you put together that and how we sort of move and how we live, you quickly see that about half of our emissions in London are from those two sectors alone. The blue area is our business area, industrial, commercial, and institutional, representing about a third of our greenhouse gas emissions locally. And for those with that technical bone, those are referred to as the scope one and scope two emissions. When we started our engagement, on the Climate Emergency Action Plan and the Climate Emergency Declaration, we had a good base of information locally because we've been working here with so many good people for many years. Plus we tapped into our colleagues and other municipalities and we pulled together a reasonable program over about a year and a half of engagement 
almost all of it done online, but it was quite informative. And it also highlighted the need for us to go even much deeper into the community. And we'll talk about that with respect to engagement. But what came out of all that? The draft climate emergency plan. And that was brought to committee and council here at the city about a month ago. And we've been bringing it out now to the community in various types of opportunities for comment. Three main goals on the screen. The first came out of the climate emergency declaration, net zero by 2050. We then have introduced the second key goal, improved resiliency. Obviously, we're going to have to manage severe weather now and into the future. And number three, perhaps the most important, bringing everyone along. This is a plan for everyone, whether you're an employee, an employer, or a resident of London. As we look at our greenhouse gas and what has to be reduced, we've been working towards 2050, but we now are establishing milestone targets. And our first one is 2030. So what you see on the screen there, where we, we are here, we're about a 30% reduction. We have to almost double that by 2030. Well over a million tons of greenhouse gas have to be reduced locally. That is a huge challenge. And it's a challenge we all have to take on. In our document, we've broken it into these milestones. And 2030 is one that we believe is very important because it is, in the next eight to nine years, something that we all can truly see. Many of us will still be here in London. Others will be coming to London to visit. But most communities in Canada will be looking at something very similar. On the screen, 10 areas that we'll be measuring annually as we work on progress towards the 2030 milestone target for the community. Our plan is set up with 10 areas of focus and a implementation work plan for each one. This is very key. This is the driving force behind the, draw, the, the draft climate emergency action plan. We learned clearly from what people wanted here in London, and as well as looking at other plans that have been prepared. Some municipalities have chosen to sort of prioritize what they should do first, second, third, and so on. What we're trying to do here in London is to get everything launched at the same time. And we'll come back to why that's important. What you see on the screen is the first five areas of focus. Number one, community engagement, essential. The area in red though, is where we're tackling greenhouse gases. Buildings and development, huge sector. Transportation, our biggest sector. Consumption and waste. The next five work plans, two of them once again, focusing on reducing greenhouse gases. Leadership at the city, in our projects and with council. Number nine is fascinating. We'll touch on that shortly. And of course, measuring, monitoring, and providing feedback. How are Londoners doing? How are businesses doing? Threaded through all the work plans, as I mentioned, is this notion of community engagement. It must be broader, deeper, and more reflective of London. That is a commitment that staff are making. It's a commitment that council has made. And we know the community is ready for this. That will take time because we have to find new ways of reaching different audiences in London. When we talk about strength of alignment, what we're referring to here is that when we look at our work plans, they have been designed to launch all at the same time. And if everyone knows where we're heading, not everyone has to be in agreement. And in fact, you, you, you almost want some tension in the system, but if we all are rowing in a very similar or same direction, we're gonna achieve a lot together. Multiple actions and activities can occur at one time and we don't have to always rely on one another to do things. We can collectively work together and rely on everyone rowing. Business opportunities, economic development, paramount for the money that is going to be spent on this plan over several decades. We need new things discovered and we need new solutions. And what better way than to engage the university and the local college and our school boards. Wonderful opportunities exist and have been highlighted in our plan. How are we going to pay for this? Parts are known right now and some parts are gonna to have to be developed. 
Our next couple of years, we are gonna be leveraging existing and approved budgets. A great example is on the screen. It is a project called the Mobility Master Plan. This is just getting out of the gate right now. It's tackling our number one sector of greenhouse gas emissions. It is a funded project valued at about 900,000 and we'll be trying many different ways of engaging in the community and finding the right way for us to move around the city. The Green Bin Program and parts of the 60% Waste Diversion Action Plan, those are moving forward and those are gonna be adjusted where appropriate to make sure climate change is even more front and center, in particular on the engagement side. All of this then goes into some further development plans for future multi-year budgets. And for those that know, or perhaps don't know, the multi-year budget is how London conducts its long-term, or sorry, its four-year budgeting process, where we look at tax rates over a four-year cycle, so we can spread out projects and programs over multi-years. What has been done just recently though, and, and many people are probably aware of parts of this, but it is some tremendous investment here in London, about 400 million in the last three years on many aspects that deal with climate change. And in fact, what you see on the screen is about 80% focused on how we move in this city. The, the bottom of that table, a clear project dealing with adaptation and something very visible in this community that most people don't realize is being done to address climate change. The last few slides just highlight some other aspects of the climate plan that all are sort of interconnected, but represent interesting opportunities and choices. The money that we all spend, you, me, businesses in London, on energy amounts to about 1.5 billion per year. And it's ranged between 1.4 and as high as 1.6. But most of that expenditure leaves the city of London. It doesn't really benefit the local economy. With changes in how we actually consume energy, or even better, not consume energy, you can see how adjustments can be made to drive those dollars locally. Energy audits and energy efficient projects for your household keeps dollars right here in the community and reduces your spend on energy. Less gasoline at the pump, save dollars, put money back in your pocket to buy that second or third bicycle. All things that can be done here locally. You look at waste in the system. Food waste, just as one example. It, it, it's, it's tragic in, in so many words when you think about the amount of avoidable food waste that goes into the garbage and the financial value of it, as you see on the screen. But even more important is when you bring in the notion of greenhouse gases that are then essentially tossed into a garbage bag and off to the landfill site. So here we have an opportunity to not only save and keep money in residents' pockets, but also reduce greenhouse gas when we bring together these important connections. We're not going to be letting businesses off the hook, but if we just spend a few minutes, the last, last minute or so, looking at the household level. Two major sources of energy are consumed and contribute the most. Gasoline, as we've talked about, and of course, natural gas, how we heat and cool our homes. Now, in London, the average household, about 10 and a half tons of greenhouse gas per year, about 4.8 tons per person. But not all households are alike. And in fact, if we design a plan that is for the average household, we know it's not gonna work. We must work with individuals. And in this case here, we're saying at the household level, and in our plan, we've actually identified 11 different household types and income brackets and lifestyle brackets. Each one will actually do their fair share for 2030 to do their part to meet the targets. Not everyone does the same. Some will be required to do more in part because they are contributing more greenhouse gases in part due to their lifestyle. My last slide, once again, is just one to thank you for being here tonight with us. I'm looking forward to the dialogue. We're going forward with this on April 5th to our strategic priorities and policy committee. And between now and then, we sure to hope to hear not only from you tonight and from your other special guests, but wonderful opportunities exist over the next uh, almost month to get more information in front of our city council as uh, 
a very big decision has to be made in our next steps. So thanks, Deepika. I'm going to stop there and pass it back to you. Thanks, Jay, for presenting. Um, now we're going to head off into breakout rooms. So I'm just going to set those up. Uh, so I just said hello. My name is Brandon Dockstader. I'm Bear Clan from the Oneida Nation of the Thames. I work for my community as our environment and consultation coordinator. Uh, Wagasununi just means welcome. Uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, in this space, uh, virtual space. Um, speaking with you guys today. And I really uh, appreciate the city um, inviting us out for London Environmental Network, inviting us out to, to discuss this and have these conversations. Um, <clears throat> in the short time I, I have here, I wanted to talk about uh, two things before I get into the climate change plan. So from a Haudenosaunee perspective, as I mentioned, uh, Oneida, are, um, are, we're from Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy, which is the people of Longhouse. And uh, some of the things that we do or what, uh, how we start is the Ganahala Duxla. And it's known as the Thanksgiving Address or the words that are said before all else. And so the Gunahala Duxla uh, is a natural law that talks about the responsibilities of our people uh, and the obligations that we have to the natural environment. And so it's a, it's a law that's rooted in uh, a bottom-up approach, one that looks at, first. well, first of all, it looks at the people and says, like, we should put our minds together as one, you know, and and all of us can be happy. And when all of us are happy, then we can work on these issues. Um, and so it's a natural law that predates um, uh, European colonization, uh, one that still continues to this day and how our communities interact with, uh, uh, with the natural environment here. <clears throat> the second piece I wanted to talk about was the, um, the four moose. And this comes from the indigenous, indigenous circle of experts. And they had some discussions around conservation, climate action uh, in, in indigenous conservation areas. Um, and so some of the barriers to conservation, to climate action for indigenous communities. And so uh, they were talking about it like um, what's like before we meet, we need to address the elephant in the room, and um, and so the elders at this meeting they discuss well we don't really have elephants in in Canada, but we do have moose, and so in the four directions there was uh, these four moose and the barriers that uh, Indigenous people face. So the first barrier is jurisdiction. And so if you can understand that in the way that there's a federal government, the provincial government, municipal governments, and First Nations governments. And so when all of these different uh, governments are interacting, that jurisdictional piece can really get messy. And so that's one of the first barriers that uh, Indigenous people are facing when it comes to climate action. The second barrier would be financial solutions and finding innovative models to address climate action in Indigenous communities. Uh, I want to acknowledge the work that uh, Carolinian Canada Coalition and uh, Chippewa the Tenth First Nation uh, and all of their partners are working on on what's called the um, Dishkan Zibi Conservation Bond. Uh, if you um, know about that. It's a really innovative model that allows for, um, for, in, for investors to invest in, invest in social action. And so I really think that's one of the ways of the future to tackle financial um, burdens in Indigenous communities. So I would check that out. The uh, third moose would be uh, capacity in Indigenous communities. So as I mentioned in, in my community, Oneida, uh, I'm the environment uh, consultation coordinator but my background is in archaeology and, and anthropology. And so um, as much as I love the work, you know, it's not actually my background in my field. And, uh, and, I, and I come at it from a historical perspective, but um, we always need those technicians, you know, the um, 
and there's and like that goes back to that funding too right like um a lot of a lot of issues with that but um the fourth moose as we would call it would be the keystone species and so some communities you know with all of these um compounding issues some communities are only able to focus on what is culturally and significantly important to them and so for example in my community um black ash is a really significant um plant in our community um has ceremonial medicinal um and economic benefits to our community um and is one of the um one of the keystone species in our community um and so, so we like to frame our conversations around these keystone species in our community. That way, um, it allows the Indigenous communities to really focus on the important pieces while still getting them involved, if that makes sense, where there's just, there's, there's a lot of issues, as everyone knows. And so sometimes it's better to focus on some of these specific ones, but then that loses when, when, um, funding and when um, opportunities are going for these other aspects. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about in terms of both uh, an Indigenous perspective on where we come at it from, but also the challenges and barriers that come along with that. Um, and so just quickly, the, um, the, the London Environmental um, or Climate Action Plan so some of the things that I found interesting within there is it talks about working with Indigenous communities on rejuvenative, rejuvenative ag agricultural practices. And so this is a really interesting um, thing, especially for me, because uh, my family does a lot of farming, does a lot of discussions around um, community home gardens. And so we do have a lot of um, farmers in our community who, who still practice um, organic farming who still practice um, that cultural like it's like uh, the easiest way to explain it is our longhouses you know over a 400 year period um, only moved a six mile radius from where they were from where they were and that's because they took care of the soil made sure it was rejuvenated and practiced selective farming you know would farm over here then farm over here and 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 so that's kind of um one thing that um, our communities did. Um, the other aspect I wanted to talk about that's within the plan, uh, well, that actually isn't in the plan, is the discussion around tiny homes. I think that smaller living, you know, um, one, it would help um, the homeless, it would help, you know, single families or single people. And, and if the city could invest in tiny homes, that would significantly I believe help um, um, foster uh, more community actions and looking at climate change in a way that's more local in that sense. So that's all I gotta say. I won't go, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's really important, those issues. Just really great to hear your thoughts about um, the draft climate emergency action plan and what still needs to be included. Um, so thank you so much for presenting tonight. So I'm going to pass it off to our next speaker, Skylar Frank from Urban League of London. Hey folks, uh, Skylar here. I'm currently the president of the Urban League of London, so I'm wearing a different hat, although many of you know me on the call as uh, the executive director at the London Environmental Network. But today I'm going to be talking a little bit from the Urban League's perspective. For those of you who haven't heard of the Urban League before, it's an umbrella group that includes neighborhood and community groups across the city. And we do a lot of uh, work to support community engagement and also a lot of advocacy at the municipal level. Um, and as a group that supports all these neighborhood groups and community groups, there's over like 40 different neighborhood associations. Um, we hear a lot from neighbors about the importance of addressing climate change for both their communities, especially for, for neighbors that are in flood pr prone neighborhoods. But we also hear a lot about families and, and people um, who are wanting to take action because they're nervous about what the future looks like. And last year we were able to connect with a lot of the uh, Urban League members and we offered actually through Laura, who's here tonight, um, some opportunities to engage with Project Neutral and also on the draft um, submission to 
to the city to develop this community um, under, uh, emergency action plan. So um, we have been chatting with, with the different neighborhood associations, trying to see what steps we can take. Um, and as Jay outlined, rainfall intensity is increasing in London um, and projected to only increase more. And many of our neighborhoods are in, in floodplain areas and people who um, live rough, unfortunately, also are living close to the river. So there are a lot of uh, addressing. Um, both with nature-based solutions and also building infrastructure options, which leads me into kind of my main point, which is, as you know, um, many of you might have already read the London Plan or been really engaged in its development, and I think it's almost through the tribunal, which is very exciting, and that outlines the, the need that we have to build differently. Um, you know, London is a very car-dependent city, very urban sprawl based and that is uh, replicated in many North American communities because it, it was developed around having access to a car. But the London plan really develops um, or encourages the city to develop inwards and upwards and uh, focuses at medium density and high density neighborhoods. And in order to achieve a lot of these climate change targets, we really need these communities and neighborhoods both moving forward and also the ones we have already to be compact. And we need residents to be able to work and shop and go to school all within 15 to 20 minutes from their, from their home, um, which really means we have to build and live differently. So we know that Londoners want to tackle climate change, but unfortunately a lot of the infrastructure that's provided to them requires that they have a car to get to work, to get to school. Uh, and we all know that London's number one source of emissions is from cars. So we really need to be focusing on getting people walking, cycling, busing, and building that infrastructure to support it. And I think this uh, draft emergency climate action plan is a really good first step to help guide residents. Um, I encourage people to talk to their neighbors about what next steps you can do in your community to be more climate friendly. I installed a heat pump at my house and I had neighbors come over and they're like, what's that? And it started a really great discussion about, about what they can do for their home. So I encourage you guys all to take an opportunity to go and chat with your neighbor about the climate action plan and what you guys are already doing. Um, the other thing I encourage people to do is talk to your city councillor about this plan and tell them that you want to see climate action and you want to see it funded. And we also have two elections coming up this year. There's a provincial and a municipal one. So there's two opportunities for people to help influence who gets elected and making sure people who really care about climate action are, are the ones making decisions. So again, I encourage you guys to vote, but also help on people's campaigns. The last thing I'd say for the Urban League is that our next monthly meeting is at the end of March, and it's actually about urban agriculture and community gardens, which if you know the community gardens in London, they are very subscribed to. Um, people love community gardening. So um, I'll put the link in the chat after I'm done, but I encourage people to check out that event, but also garden both either on your own property if you have space or consider signing up to have a community garden because that really reduces food miles um, and also improves our resiliency to, to future impacts that we might have in our food systems. So lots of ways for neighborhoods and neighbor leaders to take action on climate change. And if you wanna have any of these conversations offline, please reach out to the Urban League. We are trying to see how we can help neighborhoods, you know, continue to develop their, their climate awareness. So thank you. Thanks Skylar for presenting. Um, yes, the community aspect is really important. Um, something that really should be focused on because if everyone does these actions, we could really make a difference. So thank you so much for presenting tonight. I'm going to introduce Leah Derricks from the London Environmental Network to start her presentation. Thank you. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Leah. I'm the operations manager at the London Environmental Network. Uh, just in case you don't know about what we do, we are a registered charity that aims to make London one of the greenest and most resilient cities in Canada. We run several programs that help Londoners, local businesses, and nonprofit organizations to reduce their emissions and create positive environmental change. Um, so the draft seat and its implementation is really, really important for London uh, to reach its emission targets and to create a more resilient city. Uh, we believe that net zero by 2050 is not only possible, uh, it's our only option. Our plan needs to be immediate, and effective, and also it needs to engage the community. Uh, we believe that these changes are something that everyone should be really excited about uh, because not only will it reduce emissions, it'll also create communities that are more livable, connected, able to withstand climate change impacts, and support a healthier environment for all living things. 
So since the draft plan was released, uh, some members of the London Environmental Network reviewed the plan together and identified some areas uh, for improvement and feedback. So as a sector, we're really excited to see a wide range of climate action initiatives represented in the plan. We're really happy to see the plan use science-based emissions targets. Uh, we like how there are 10 work plans, as Jay kind of shared, um, of activities, and we like how everyone in London has a role to play in the plan. Uh, however, we have some feedback and we'd like to see a greater emphasis on the draft plan priorities, uh, the budget and the accountability as well. Uh, we wanna know exactly how we're going to reach our targets as a city. And specifically, we'd like the plan to include a list of short-term projects and how they'll be implemented in the next two to three years. We'd like the plan's timeline to be tied to a four-year cycle of either council terms or the multi-year budget cycle. And we'd also like the plan to include a budget with staff allocation and cost savings. Uh, so thank you to everyone who's attending this community conversation with us tonight. Um, here are some quick ways that you can help us to support the plan. So you can register for the public participation meeting uh, happening on April 5th. So I'll put some info in the chat about how you can register for that. Uh, you can also send an email to your city councillor to show your support. And on our website, we have an email template that you can adapt and send to your city councillor. So I'll put the link to that in the chat as well. And you can also submit your feedback through the city's website, as Jay mentioned too. Um, so I'll put those in the chat. Thanks for your attention and I'll pass it over to the next speaker. Thanks, Leah, for presenting. Um, I'm going to pass it off to our final speaker, Luis Patricio from Pillar Nonprofit Network. Thanks, Deepika. Um, and, and hopefully we don't have a few co-speakers join me uh, during my talk. Um, I'll try to be uh, short. Um, so I work at Pillar Nonprofit Network. Um, our mission basically is to amplify positive impact in the community. Uh, and obviously, um, we're talking about addressing the climate change uh, and really uh, focusing on our climate emergency uh, efforts. Uh, Pillar Nonprofit Network really work in the space of cross-sector collaboration. So uh, we, we really want to be um, play an active role in supporting the plan. Um, we believe that we all have a role as an enabler of change and also as a target of change. As a target of change, um, Pillar is working on a, a few different things, like um, starting to think about our green plan and how our energy and water and, and waste uh, um, are being addressed in our, we have a, a, a beautiful four-store building downtown. Uh, we are part of the bike-friendly business network, uh, was organized by London Cycle Link. Uh, and as we all see in this presentation, um, Emissions for, for personal vehicles is the main source of GHC emissions. So this is one of the most important things. And, and I want to make clear, and uh, Skylar already alluded to this. Uh, and if you didn't see, um, I don't know if anyone has the, this link easy, uh, the talk from Brent Todoran a couple of years ago, um, just before the pandemic, and uh, when he was saying that we can't have the cake and eat it, uh, we really need to focus on the things that work. Uh, uh, and, and put our uh, efforts into not just one thing, but the, the things that we know that really are gonna make a difference. Uh, this is what we really need to do. Also as a target of change, um, starting to think about a sustainable procurement. Uh, so that addresses also not just our scope one emissions, but also our scope two emissions. Um, as an enabler of change, um, we have some programs in our, in our organization uh, Verge Capital, um, Women's of Ontario Social Entrepreneur Network, the Social Enterprise Incubator, that are uh, not supporting, not directly supporting all the um, environmental initiatives, but also a local economy. Uh, and a local economy is a more resilient economy, uh, and by definition, is a low carbon economy. And obviously, I'm the um, manager of the SDG Cities program, uh, working on the Sustainable Development Goals. And we have quite a few different um, uh, activities within the program. We have the Academy trying to support organizations, integrate uh, sustainability 
in their environmental, um, economic, and social aspect. We have a community learning ser series to talk about a lot of those issues uh, regarding climate uh, change. Uh, we have some emerging uh, research projects now with Huron and, and hopefully with other universities, and we're going to have a public library of, of resources as well um, for government, for nonprofit organizations, for businesses, and for individuals as well. Um, and so we want to, we really want to amplify those efforts, and this, this ties to area one of the plan, engaging, inspiring, and learning. Um, and we have at the city, we have the, the CEEP, the Climate Emergency Plan, that has its, one of its goals, one of its principles is to bring everyone along. Um, and, and, and I think it does a great job in thinking about all the different, it's a really a whole of society approach. Uh, we all need to pull our weight and, and also understanding that we all will be affected by, the, um, cl by climate change. But I think it's important to go one step beyond. It's a great opportunity to really address the existing inequalities that we have in our society regarding mobility, regarding housing, regarding food. Um, I think um, Brandon made a, a great point when he mentioned, for example, the tiny homes. And it, it's great to think about reducing um, emissions uh, from, from housing. But what other... Uh, what are actions we can take that can actually reduce our footprint uh, in the households that we have. So enabling tiny homes, it's, it's a great example. One of the most, most obvious ones for us, for example, is if, you're, if we know the personal vehicles is the number one and we're talking about emissions, um, we need to consider that we not only want to divest from fossil fuels, but we want to invest in something that will not cause traffic congestion, that will not promote uh, sprawling, um, uh, active transportation and public transit that can actually create more social connection, that can actually create a more uh, uh, healthier uh, lifestyle um, and, and things like this. Um, we do have the London Community Recovery Framework that has environmental sustainability as one of the main um, principles as well. And only one of the out of four, 31 indicators is dedicated to climate emergency. Another great opportunity to bring all of those other 30 indicators that are addressing uh, our economic recovery to think about climate emergency as well. And then we have the third plan, the uh, community safety and well-being plan. There is an emergent plan mandated by the province that is talking about our, well, it's essentially a social plan and it's looking into integrating the other two. So how do we bring all those three together? At Pillar, we're really about our, one of our main um, uh, issues that we are, we are addressing is equity, diversity, and inclusion. But the second uh, most uh, relevant issue for us as a team is climate change, as we did a, a, a team alignment exercise just, just uh, a while ago. So we understand that bringing those things together is really important. And the SDGs, it's a per perfect fit because they really look at those three uh, pillars of sustainability. We do have, you know, most of the large businesses already using the SDGs language. We already have the federal government using that same uh, sustainable development goals language with a national strategy and funds to support implementation. And it's a great opportunity for us as, as an organization uh, to help support integrate those brands and, and really leverage what we can do with each one of them. Um, and, uh, and, and just to tie in with the last two areas that we think we can contribute as an organization, Area 9, um, to think innovative and um, aligning those plans and Area 10 and measuring and monitoring. There's a tool already built for that. There's a proven model using in other Canadian cities, a voluntary local review, a living dashboard where you can have a shared vision in a shared measurement, and we can really have a um, shared accountability. I think it's it's so important, uh, and it was mentioned earlier before, to pay attention, uh, to really focus and, and work together and roll together, uh, as Jay was saying. We really need that uh, living dashboard where we all can see uh, not only where we want to go, but how fast and we, which direction we're moving. Uh, and those are a few ways that uh, we believe that Pillar can contribute to the Climate Emergency Action Plan. Thanks, everyone. And I'll pass back to you, uh, Deepika. Thanks, Luis, for uh, speaking tonight. Tonight we had like a lot of different perspectives, so that's just really great. 
Um, so now we're going to jump into our second breakout room. So I'm going to open all the rooms again. Just waiting on a couple of more people. And I think everyone's here. Um, so yeah, I hope you all discussed um, some important ideas in your breakout room. Um, I was looking through the comments and I saw that um, someone was wondering if I was going to share the poll results. So I'll just do that now before we go on to our next poll. So for the first one, it's, would you recommend the council approve the plan as soon as possible and start taking actions? Most people said yes. Some people are unsure, which is totally fine. Um, so that was the first poll. And now the second poll, based on what you read in the plan, are you willing to make changes to your lifestyle to make reductions? Most people said yes. Some people are unsure. And that's also totally fine. It's very difficult to like start doing these things. So totally understand. Um, so yeah, those were the ones that we already did. So now I'm just going to launch our third poll. Um, so yeah, what do you think is the biggest action London can take to address climate change? Um, so it appears most people said invest in public transit and also roll out the green bin program. Both are really big things. Um, so yeah, that was our third poll. I'm going to launch our final poll. Um, so in your opinion, what are the top three barriers that restrict action on climate change in London? I don't see capitalism. That's just like taken for granted. That's the I, I mean, it's in, a, it's in a lot of them, but. Yeah. <laughs> the development community. Can I vote for that three times? I'm going to end the poll now. Share the results. So I guess the top three, pressure from the development community. Um, infrastructure or service availability to support individuals' behavior changes and a car-centric culture seem to be the general consensus. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing this poll. And now it's we're going to dive into our Q&A session. We might go a few minutes over um, if that's all right with everyone. Um, if you have any questions, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen and I will call on you to ask your question, or if you would like to write down your question into the chat, that's also fine, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, so yeah, we're going to start the Q&A session. Paul, go ahead. Thanks, Deepika. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, questions for, for Jay and other folks from the city. I'm wondering, um, uh, it's a friendly question. Um, but I'm wondering how we can make the Climate Emergency Action Plan um, like the one ring that rules them all. And that's a Lord of the Rings re reference. So, um, so I'll elaborate without the, without the silly reference. Um, you know, there's, uh, we're sort of finally really truly entering into the year of the London Plan. Um, uh, we've, uh, you know, just recently um, uh, developed the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. Um, you know, you have a lot of influence, I presume, on the Waste Diversion Action Plan, um, you know, but there are 15, 20 plans and secondary plans um, that, uh, that have, well, I mean, every single plan like, has implications, right? So I'm wondering how, first, um, we make sure, or what, what is the city's plan for making sure that um, uh, places where there's um, sort of bureaucratic um, conflict are resolved in favor of the Climate Emergency Action Plan, um, places where there are policy conflict are resolved in favor of the Climate Emergency Action Plan, and by doing that, protect the Climate Emergency Action Plan against, you know, uh, the vicissitudes of political change, right? Um, 
you know, how do we make sure that the climate emergency action plan, once adopted, once it's fleshed out with with actions, uh, how do we make sure that um, that it, it is the one plan that um, sort of guides our actions? Thanks, Paul. Uh, great question. Now, in, in a city with lots of priorities, it's always hard to have the only priority, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is this. Over the last year and a half, we've been, as, as you saw in one of my slides, talking about alignment of the plan within the community, the business sector. We've gone through that same alignment exercise internally at City. And we have met with all the senior leaders, and they all understand the importance of the business that they're in, but also introducing the climate lens into their business operations. So that is already underway and that has got uh, support from top to bottom. Now, Mike Fabro is on the call tonight. Uh, he's been working on a team with others who have gone to all levels in the organization and have started exactly what you described. It's not perfect yet, but every big thing goes under the climate lens. And we actually produced a couple of reports back in August. So what it was that about six months ago, where we looked at transportation and we looked at waste management. And for those that don't recall, the Wonderland Road project, which was a road widening, was brought to a halt essentially. And it is, that whole project is essentially moved into the mobility master plan. So that is one sign of many, Paul, to address what you're thinking. Uh, it takes time, no doubt about it. But uh, uh, from our perspective here, all other priorities in London can go alongside climate change because they all impact one another. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks, Jay. Um, I mean, I was looking at the Gantt chart, you know, it's like four point, it's like one item, right? It's like 4.8 review existing plans. And it's like, oh, that needs to be fleshed out maybe. So, I mean, I, I appreciate hearing that that work has, has already started and it's well underway. Um, but that'll be, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'll, you know, be supportive as I can in that process of making sure that, um, that the climate emergency action plan is protected in that way from, um, from, uh, um, conflict with other policy initiatives. Thanks. Thanks for that question. A lot to think about in that question. So I really appreciate <laughs> you asking that. Um, Oh, there's a question from Skylar in the chat. Will there be another round of CEST being used that the public can see? Sorry, Dipak, I'm not quite understanding the question. Another round of CEST. I think I know what she's getting at there, Jay. So much in the same way that uh, reports came forward in August as a result of the application of our climate lens process. I think Scott was wondering, and Scott, feel free to jump in to clarify, but she's wondering if, uh, yeah, if um, there's gonna be more reports like that or, or that sort of thing. And if I may, I'll just jump in and say, you know, uh, in, in the CEAP, we've indicated that staff reports that come forward to all the different committees um, that address a topic that, ha that has anything to do with climate change will actually have a specific section in that staff report where we identify the climate change connections. And so the idea there, and, and that's the, the real key to that climate lens process is that we are presenting the information so that decision makers have it in front of them so that they can see what the climate implications are of the work that they're, that they're reviewing at that point. Um, so while there may not be a specific, uh, specific you know, climate lens themed report coming forward, and that may happen, we don't have any planned at the moment, but that may happen. Uh, but in the absence of that, you should still see the evidence of the climate lens application in staff reports coming forward to various committees. I'm not sure if you wanted to add to that too, Jay. No, that, 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 that's good. It's one of those things, uh, we have to balance clearly taking action versus writing reports. And I, I, I kind of chuckle, I do a lot of report writing and uh, no, no one reads them, let's face it. The reality is I think we're all about action and all these parts are important. Um, thanks. Oh, thanks, Skylar. <laughs> Just reading through the chat there. Uh, I see, David, go ahead. Yeah, in our breakout room, we ended up talking about um, the dual sewer and um, the fact that uh, our sewage is still contaminating Brandon's community's water supply. And it's that, that I'm gonna say colonial violence has been going on for too long. So I'd like to hear, first of all, Brandon's perspective on water at Oneida and, and uh, what we have to fix to be good neighbors. 
Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, I, when I was thinking about this, for me, it goes back to that biosolids management plan that the city of London is talking about. Um, you know, the city has dumped uh, raw sewage, primary treated sewage uh, into into the river for many years. Um, and there is steps being taken to, to address that, but currently, um, you know, it's a perceived risk in, in the community's eyes and one that affects the health of the, of the, of the river. You know, it's a, where our source water comes from, but also even just on the end where like where it ends up in Lake Erie, you know, with the algae blooms. Um, and how the Thames River is the biggest contributor on Canada's side to that. And so um, that's one thing I think the City of London could really be um, taking in earnest is tackling um, that um, those challenges, especially with the combined sewers, the... Um, and there's, there's a lot of various plans, but um, ramping up some of those infrastructure projects and getting those done, I think, um, should be a priority over the next five years. Thanks. And any other time, I'd love to hear you talk about black ash all, uh, as long as you want. But I think on this forum, that's what I needed to hear about. Thank you. Mm, how? Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for the question. I'm uh, just going to look through the chat and see if there's any other questions or if anyone wants to um, ask their question by raising their hand, that's fine too. Um, um, so let's see, I see a hey, bunch of stuff in Jennifer, the chat. Can I ask yes. a question? Sure. <laughs> Great, well, we've got a, an important audience here tonight and I was very impressed with the breakout rooms because we've got all different ages. It's just wonderful to see. Honestly, I, 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 we really hope that tonight will turn into comments on our online pieces. So I, I don't think we can really do a show of hands, but if we could, we would. But I sure would like to think that 100% of the people tonight are going to go online just for a few additional comments. And the reason I say that is that we're in challenging times right now, no doubt about it. And there's lots of priorities around the world, but we, we can't lose sight of this as being a priority as well. And so we really do need to hear from Londoners. There's tragedy out there everywhere and hearts go out to everyone out there on all these items. But let's let's keep this one up there with uh, the other difficult ones as well. So please do your part. Thanks. Um, so we have time for one more question. I'm just going I, to- Oh, it, it's Judy, I put my hand up, but- uh... If I can just add to Jay that if you can go on the Climate Action London website and sign the SEEP pledge, the Climate Emergency Action Plan pledge, we're trying to get 10,000 Londoners to sign it. So if you can push it out to your networks and your networks and your book clubs and your neighbors um, and personally take some uh, responsibility for this very serious issue. Thank you. Um, so I think I, I put my hand up a while ago. Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, I totally I, missed it. Go so ahead. I have a question for Brandon. Is this human sewage that's being poured into the lake or river? It's human. It's not animal sewage, is it? And where does it come from? Yeah, no. Yeah, so, um, so one of the one of the issues is that the city of London has combined sewers in its downtown area. And so that would be your your wastewater and your stormwater. And so some so when it rains, those sewers are combined, and that that wastewater and st stormwater goes to the wastewater treatment plant, and that may sometimes overload the system. And to prevent it from um, damaging any infrastructure, uh, they may have to either release the raw sewage, the primary, or the secondary treatment, depending on. Um, where they're at in the system. I'm sorry to hear that, that's horrible. But I'm, I'm going to copy what Judith just said, and I'm going to say, endorse the plant-based treaty. Thousands of people have already done so. We certainly need your voice as well. Thank you. Um, uh, I mean... Sorry. Um, 
just <laughs> one comment about the um, pipelines that we have here. Um, I was working with some university students uh, a week back, and they said if uh, the city told everyone not to flush the toilet during a certain period of time, when uh, we were expecting overflows into the river, that could be a big help and it wouldn't cost anything. What do you think, Jay? <laughs> uh, interesting. I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not aware of that. I, I, I'm sure that could be mathematically done. Um, but definitely some, something I can share with my colleagues in uh, okay. the wastewater area. You can tell them I came from an engineering student. <laughs> okay, we'll do. Thanks. Thank you so much for all the questions, everyone. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I know we went over quite a bit, um, but this is a really important topic to talk about. So I appreciate you all um, staying on the call and asking your questions. Um, there was a lot of good stuff here being discussed, and it was great hearing a lot of different perspectives about the Climate Emergency Action Plan and what is needed. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our partner organizations for presenting tonight, helping us organize this event, um, and also to all of you, the attendees, for participating in our discussion about the draft Climate Emergency Action Plan. We have collected all of your feedback, and the city will be reviewing that and we'll be considering what you all said when it comes to making adjustments to the plan. So thank you so much for taking part in tonight's event. Um, with that, I'm going to sign off and wrap up. So I hope you all have an amazing evening. Thank you so much.